We're ringing in. It's Friday. There's Gerard. There's David Thorpe. Drew's little at home quarantine show. Um, how's everybody doing? Basketball's back. Good. Yes. I enjoy being called little. <laughs> Doesn't happen very often. Oh, right. Yeah. Like I don't see it all the time. All the six, eight to seven, four guys I have <laughs> in my gym. No. <laughs> There's nothing like interviewing Sean Bradley to feel just like, (laughs) I feel like a flea. Um, So there's basketball. And honestly, just during the little, like, you know, usually during our warm up period and we're making sure the zoom works. um, We talk about like uh, capitalism or healthcare or Ghislaine Maxwell. But today we were talking about pick and roll coverage. (laughs) (laughs) That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. The, the LeBron Anthony Davis pick and roll. It's a nightmare. It's a nightmare, nightmare to defend. <laughs> I guess it's exactly what we feared would happen is that people will get distracted and entertained from the important issues, but it's fun to get distracted and entertained sometimes. Right, exactly. Yeah. Oh, but don't worry. I'll, I'll bring it back. <laughs> oh, we're, oh, we're not worried. <laughs> Rock and roll. All right, Gerard, take it away. So on today's 9 by 90 all three of my topics are dedicated to number one band of all time, the capitalist machine. So first article I want to talk about is this idea that the NBA Board of Governors are broke. And Brian Winterhorst wrote about this, um, financial turmoil pretends future payroll problems. And I use broke in air quotes, like these dudes are not broke. But the situation is with the less TV money coming in, with the lower salary cap next year, and with their other industries that they work in and amass their billions taking a financial hit, the question becomes now, well, where do they get money from to manage their payroll? Golden State Warriors um, got $250 million or they're working on that on a line of capital from Golden Sachs. Makes sense because when the Chase Center opens, they're going to be able to get all their money back from concerts, but it hasn't been open in months. And they don't know when that's going to be. What I find interesting here is that we have owners who own teams but don't want to now spend the money they have because they all have it, right? And it's to varying degrees. Liquidate some of your other assets and get out there and spend the money and don't, if you, because if you can't own the team, to Henry's point, why do you have it, right? Let's take it away from you and give it to someone who has the money. Steve Ballmer, I doubt, will be in a problem like this because he's got, I don't know, $70 billion, give or take. The <laughs> Lakers will be fine. They've got their TV money. But Chesapeake, the, the, the owners of the Oklahoma City Thunder, energy stocks, not looking so great. Mickey Harrison, cruise lines, ah, not looking great. Our man Tillman down in Houston, ah, not looking so good. So liquidate your other money. Stop fronting like you don't have any and spend it on your team. Everybody's smiling. Powerful stuff. Powerful <laughs> stuff. So my first thing is going to be about, guess what, basketball. <gasps> and uh, we were treated with uh, a little Meek Mill, which I did not know that. I, I have a Meek Mill song in my repertoire, but um, uh, we're going to hear a little bit about his beginning. I can't breathe! Give people an understanding of life. I try to deliver some type of story and message through my music. Uh, we scream Black Lives Matter, but we still towing ladders. Watch- so I'm watching this beginning with my son. We're in our family room. We normally watch games in the office, but there's only one game on, so we stayed in the main house. And that's his favorite artist, which I did not know. I knew we, I knew we liked Meek Mill. Uh, and we, we talked about what the song was what he was saying in the song. And it just occurred to me, man, I've been doing this for a long time watching games. When I was his age, it was old Motown for me. It was the, it was the Four Tops, The Temptations, Marvin Gaye, The Jackson Five. And, and they sang it mostly about happy stuff. And that was fine. And, and the Commodores. But, but people like my son are listening to Meek Mill and calling him their favorite artist. And there, there is an innate or an inherent knowledge base that you gain from hearing artists like that and I'm, I, I love that the NBA is bringing that as part of the culture of the sport now. I think it's one of the best things about the sport. If the game had been played, those few seconds were precious to me. Shout out to the Commodores. I once told a girl that my dad was in the Commodores as a pickup line, and it worked. <laughs> I've seen, I saw him live. I saw him live in 1983. Thinking about we should hire an animator to do something about David Thorpe and the Commodores, like just an extended. It'd be good. Thing. Okay. Um, Judy, do you mind playing this little, there we go. Okay, so this play, which is a very famous play from the opening, okay. Um, This right here, that moment, that's a Kobe moment, right? This is like LeBron's been distinguished as the guy who would pass the ball in that situation or get a quality shot. This was a terrible shot. Um, It turned out to be a bucket, but um, we're lauding LeBron for 
leading the NBA in assists. And it just, that's not what happened on this play. Worked out fine. I feel like, look at the Clippers. Five Clippers in the paint and the Laker gets the offensive rebound. This was the, I called David and I'm like, I feel like we're seeing, honest to goodness, rust here. Like, this is just not, you don't see playoff basketball like that. But um, yeah. anyway, I thought, I felt a little bit like, you know, LeBron has a tendency to be a little controlling and overbearing, which is what leads to these hero ball type shots. And I just was a little surprised that, of the game on the line when he hadn't been that great this play came down to um such an ugly attempt i mean it worked out okay in the end um there you go that's my that's my i, I want to no i got 20 you got 25 seconds oh. right. henry you're totally right and then you said look at the clippers but i would tell you to play it again and look at how open uh kuzma was every laker every laker <laughs> right <laughs> every he, laker. Had it, he had already made a couple threes yeah that is something you and i would talk about when Kobe played, is look how wide open his teammates were. Yeah. LeBron always makes that pass. Well, they crushed LeBron for making that pass to Daniel yeah, Marshall right. mm-hmm. back in the day. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, Daniel Marshall. Yeah. Like, we don't forget that stuff. <laughs> All right. So, on Wednesday, the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Antitrust, Commercial, and Administrative Law had the four tech giants in front of them. Jeff Bezos, CEO of Amazon, Mark Zuckerberg, CEO of Facebook. Um, so, uh, I'm going to mess up his name. Sundar Pichai, the CEO of the Alphabet Company, which owns Google, and Tim Cook, CEO of Microsoft. And, you know, what we're basically seeing here, folks, is these are the 21st century robber barons, right? Like, they, were, they are the uh, John D. Rockefeller, Cornelius, Cornelius Vanderbilt, um, Car- uh, Andrew Carnegie of their time. That's who these guys are. And what's supposed to be happening is Congress and the, and the House are supposed to be really grilling them on monopolies and why they're controlling what they're controlling and literally it disenabling what we like here, which is free markets, right? And taking advantage of smaller, smaller companies and small businesses. But that wasn't what happened, right? Congress and both sides were just literally saying, you're anti, you're anti-conservative views. Democrats were saying the same thing. And it's like, that doesn't help the common good. Like you sticking out your anti-conservative claim or anti-left claim doesn't help the common good. And meanwhile, every day of our lives, while we had the worst uh, quarter in the history economy wise all these dudes fortunes especially jeff bezos is grew by leaps and bounds everybody else still worrying about am i going to get that extra 600 dollars from the government which of course you're not because they didn't extend it this is what happens in america folks capitalism run amok but right on time very impressive timing for us. <laughs> so schooled <laughs> okay, this is this is from john lewis's uh, funeral yesterday Listen, John and I had our disagreements, of course. But in the America John Lewis fought for, and the America I believe in, differences of opinion are inevitable elements and evidence of democracy in action. So last night I was watching uh, Don Lemon, who I watch most nights, uh, and I'm, I like doing so, and he was lauding that speech. Of course, Obama killed it. Uh, and um, and I, I'm certain Don Lemon was not ever saying nice things about George W. Bush when he was serving, if whatever, wherever Don Lemon was doing back then. And it just made me think of uh, the, the tone we have too often on, the, on both sides. Uh, we now know that you can be a president that people don't think is a good speaker or you don't like his philosophies, but that doesn't make him the devil. We know what the devil looks like now, for lack of a better term. Now we really know uh, uh, what that means to a level beyond anyone I think has experienced since Nixon. And so we should be reminded of that as we go forward so that the next time someone like Trump tries to run, and I think we ought to should be preparing for, he's not going to be around in, in just a few more months, but there's going to be someone just like him trying to run on that same thing. We hope, right. Um, <laughs> I'm totally ready for that. Yeah, we, we, need to, uh, we need to have decency flow through our veins and, and just look at causes and argue that, but not bedevil everybody else think about that donald trump is making us hanker for the days of george w bush like, <laughs> Not me. That, that's how bad it is <laughs> dear god help us <laughs> um so uh, michael jordan donated i think it said 2.5 million dollars to combat yeah. voter suppression that's great um here's my thing though this is an issue where i would like to draw the nba into the fray it's like okay so adam silver do you support that What about the 30 governors of NBA teams? Like, I put it to you that many of them are working on the other side. 
So if you, if Michael Jordan could do nothing but rally his fellow billionaires when they meet at the, board, at the biannual board of governors meetings, he would be ahead of the game compared to giving us 2.5 million. Um, there's this kind of uh, relationship transaction thing that I talk about all the time, right? Where um, does the NBA have a transaction with the right to vote or does it have a relationship with the right to vote, right? Like I'd, I'd rather the NBA get back the 2.5 million and just get themselves on the same page where we all want everyone votes to count. I have 40 extra seconds. Anybody want them? <laughs> I just I just tweeted in the chat. Voter suppression is real. Voter fraud is myth. Yeah, keep, yeah. keep 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 aware of that, people. Sing it. <laughs> Sing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and my final hit. I mean, and we got so many hits. We can keep going forever. College football looks like a runaway freight train right now. Um, so Notre Dame is now partnering with the ACC as a result of unusual circumstances. Uh, those unusual circumstances, of course, being a global pandemic. The SEC, of course, also released their schedule um, saying we're going to play all, com um, all conference games. If you read all of the quotes in there by the ADs and the conference uh, directors, all you see in there are conversations about protecting the sanctity and integrity of the conference and our schedule and the way we have it set up, our rivalries and the championship game. You know what's not in there? What about the football players and their health about COVID? Nobody asking questions like that. I'm wondering, does anybody know what the testing procedure is going on at colleges across the country? Of course we don't know, because no one knows, because it's a free-for-all. And this is a labor force that has no recourse. They're not the NBA. They don't have Michelle Roberts. They're not Major League Baseball. They don't have a person to say, no, 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 no. They're not doing this. It's free labor, so it's, hey, bring them on campus, get them in here. Why? Because these people need their money. Shouts to the capitalist machine. The hits just keep on coming. And I hope that as a society, no matter how much you clamor for and want your college football, this is free labor. And you're willing to jeopardize the lives and the health of young men. People are 18 kids, all for the sake of football. It's not right. So the New Yorker has a great article about uh, Vermont and how uh, they really are kind of showing the nation how, how best to handle the coronavirus. Uh, the governor is not someone that the writer, uh, Bill McKibben, I think, initially supported, but in his article, uh, and Judy, I need, okay, in his article he writes, though the governor has also been attacked, including by a few of his primary opponents, as being too restrictive, he did not rise to the bait. He understood people's frustrations, he said, but he was going to make decisions, quote, based on the science. He added, I think there's a bit of an experiment going on in Georgia as we speak. We'll see how they, how they do over the next few weeks. Later on, he says in the article, but it's pretty hard to argue with how Scott has handled the state's present. He started wearing a mask early in the pandemic and has stood at the back of the room in many of the state's coronavirus briefings, letting Dr. Mark Levine, Vermont's answer to Dr. Anthony Fauci, dominate proceedings. If you're looking for an un-Trump, Scott is it. So when you read that, your, your initial thinking might be, well, there, there's a Democratic governor for you, and you'd be wrong. That's a Republican governor, which is what Bill also writes. Uh, it, leadership doesn't have to have a party, right? Breathing spirit in the hearts and minds of others shouldn't be re related to your party. It should be based on science and empathy and also humility, knowing when you're out of your league and let someone else do it. And it's good to know that at least there are some that are doing it the right way uh, that are on that side. Thank you, David. Um, Final note here, um, although there's a lot of hubbub about the Pelicans lost a key game, and I'd like to talk later about the value of each loss for these teams that are close to others in the standings. Um, and Zion played 15 minutes because of a minutes restriction, and people kind of lose their mind about this. They're like, ah, I feel like if, if you knew what the hell he's doing, you'd just play Zion more. Um, I totally and completely disagree because of this reason. Um, we've had Marcus Elliott on the show. I've talked to him a lot. He told us that Zion pushes on the earth harder than any athlete they've ever tested, including NFL players. That means that every ligament and piece of soft tissue in Zion's body is mega forced, right? And if you just, this is just a little note, this, you, they weren't that great with Zion on the floor. It's just worth noting. Right. They might've lost worse if he played more, but, um, but uh, I don't know what the Pelicans know. And re until recently, they were considered maybe the worst NBA team in terms of uh, medical management. But that's not the case anymore. Mm -hmm. um, David Griffin's changed the whole culture there. And I don't know what they're seeing, but the notion that he's a player who's liable to, you know, now we know about movement patterns and we know his are worrisome, right? Uh, Marcus Elliott, I think, said something about 
um, saying a little prayer, right? So these are giant forces from a player who has been a little bit deconditioned. Um, I think that the, the likelihood of a giant injury event is pretty high with this guy. So managing him makes a lot of sense to me. We don't know what they know, um, but I think if we did, we'd probably all be on team, uh, sit, sit most of the game. Well, not, it, um, not to mention, yeah, he, he had been away. He, he was out of the bubble, and if he was dealing with any kind of family issue, he wasn't getting high-level training in a gym or a weight room, and also he's trying to protect himself. And then you have to quarantine when you get back, and the most they can have in his room is like an exercise bike. He ain't running sprints. He's not shooting layups or jump shots. He's doing nothing explosively. And so, yeah, you got to put him on a restriction. He had one practice, to my knowledge, one, before they played. It's a no-brainer. And well, he also, said, do I have the note here? He said in an interview they basically had not done any basketball stuff. Um, yeah, right. well, you can't. Like, no, there's no hotel rooms anywhere in America. Well, I shouldn't say that. Very few that have a basketball court and a, there is a couple, there are a couple. In your room. <laughs> there's a few. And I don't, but I don't, where he was visiting, wherever he was, yeah. I doubt they had that. Well, and those so, little charts of, like, here's how you're landing, and this is the force right. in the scene. Like, if you're seeing scary forces on there um, – and I don't know that's what the Pelicans are doing, but if they are seeing that, of course you can't have them land 10, 15, 30 times on that. And he looked, I, he looked heavy to me too. I would imagine that's what Griff and the medical team are seeing. And I think probably the challenge that they're, of course, having is Alvin wants to play him, right? And so it's like this, like, it's this push pull. And it's what we talk about all the time. It's this, I don't want to use the term old school, but like the old school way of thinking, right? And like, no, you got to kind of grind it out there and work versus do we want this guy to play for – as long as he can, or are we hoping for, you know, a meteorite? Like, you get three good years, and then it's all downhill after that. And I think that is the push-pull, and it's, you know. But, but no, they, that was a crazy impactful loss, though. I mean, just in the standings, oh, yeah. just in the numbers. Yeah. like Yeah, they, they couldn't afford it, especially when they dominated most of the game. They, they had a bad start and a very good most of the rest of the game until the very end. Uh, they're going to be dynamite if they and don't they, up. Yeah, Brandon, Brandon Ingram's fucking fantastic. He got so good. <laughs> yeah, and ironically, when we wrote it, we wrote a year ago where I said we should, they should, they should, uh, the Pelicans shouldn't wait to get Jason Tatum because they can get Brandon Ingram. I was a little bit wrong. Tatum's better. Well, they, right they now, both improved right mightily, though. Like, right, right. Yeah. So, it, it just, just right now, Tatum is better. But yeah. they got a whole bunch of other guys too, which was my point. Is yeah. Ingram's going to be close enough to Tatum? And they get all these other guys. Lonzo Ball was awful last night, or they probably win. He's not awful, though. And yeah. someone's going to have to get the ball to Ingram and Zion. He's perfect to do that, for sure. Lonzo's built for that. Uh, they kept trying to ISO. I, I don't want to say any more because I wrote this for my piece tomorrow. But David Griffin, they've got to be, hmm. <laughs> they've got some good stuff coming. Let's just get through this summer healthy. They're gonna, and Jackson Hayes is going to be really good, too. Oh, I, I like so him a athletic. lot like him a lot um oh back so we, we started the day talking about pick and roll before everybody joined on so you said draw depends on who my guys are okay so let's say it's that mythical clippers matchup lebron yeah. ad and it's Kawhi and pg against them in the pick and roll so you you're, you're coaching Kawhi and pg how do you tell them to, to defend the lebron ad pick and roll well there's a few things first of all you can't it's a huge mistake to do the same thing every time because if you're always doing the same thing lebron can anticipate everything so you've got to mix up how you're doing it. You're going to switch some. You'll, you'll force LeBron. I think he probably shoots a little better going left. Uh, so you may want to force LeBron right, whether there's a, whatever side the screen's on, make him go to his right hand. He's also not – he took 5.7 free throws a game this year. That's the lowest in his career, right? Now, part of it's because he was passing more. I get that. But I'd make him more of a right-hand driver, which is a little scary. Because he's going right hand yeah. downhill, he's got the left foot dunk, which is incredible. But I'd probably be willing to give that up. Make him go right, sometimes hard hedge. In fact, often I'd hard hedge. Definitely sometimes switch. Uh, I, I, just, I just wouldn't let them know for sure what's happening. And I'd blitz him a little bit, too. I'd double a little bit. He'll, th he'll do the quick short roll pass to Anthony, which is dangerous. But I just wouldn't let them know what's coming. Love it. So excited. Basketball's back. <laughs> Can I am. Um... Drud, you, when you were doing a little nine by 90, I got all excited. Okay, so like two thoughts occurred to me um, in quick succession. One was if they start paying those, and those college football players, for instance, mm -hmm. like they can unionize like that. Yep. That's going to be a, that's the game changer, right? That's going to be the holdup. But my second thought was, do they, can they unionize in advance? 
Well, so the nor- the Northwestern guys tried that, right? Remember, um, yeah. they, it, uh, but it didn't it, it didn't hold. Um, but yeah, I mean, but, I would love it. But were they? Maybe we need to ask Judy. Judy, you on the unfair legal yeah, counsel? Yeah, Judy, the lawyer. But were they per- legally prevented from unionizing, or did they not vote to certify the union? I can't remember. I don't remember. I, it might have been legally not allowed because it, they're not considered. I mean, even though we know they're labor, right? They're not considered labor. I feel like if I, I feel like if I were like a super powered attorney, I would be like, guys, let's try this again. Like I feel like the mood has shifted. Um, but uh, you, know, you, you know, we should have on one time is Andy Schwartz, the economist who does all this sports stuff, who like literally like lights the NCAA on fire every year yeah. <laughs> or every day. He, well, he, so he'd be really good. <laughs> I did this thing yesterday, which was delightful. Which um, Erica Van Stone and Jay McManus, um, two uh, people we revere on this show, um, organized this thing with Maris, where they had a lot of people talking about the safe return to sports. Um, and one of the people on the call who I just met it was George Atala, who's an executive with the NFL Players Association. And he was talking about how the, the, NFL, the football union, they've been talking to sports all over the world. So they've been talking to people representing like, you know, South African rugby and Australian rules football and just kind of finding out like, what's your return to play program? And it struck me like, like Michelle Roberts and George Atala can talk to college football players. I'm sure they're doing this. And basically like, you know, whether they officially absorb them into the union or if they just advise them. But if college football players have a playbook of like, we are not returning to play without boom, 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 like doubt the power to sit out is the power they have, right? Like that's 100%. But everybody fighting it individually against their coach is not going to work. No. Why aren't, why aren't, let's start with the NBA. Why aren't they doing pool testing right now? Uh, for the 30 some odd people, you can even divide into two groups if you want to players and then coaching staff and the other people that are there. Uh, and then extrapolate that to colleges. You could have your linebackers do and your defensive linemen. You can do six different pieces. And as long as I'm going to test negative that day, they can practice that day. And yes, there will be an outbreak here and there, but it won't be a super spreader because they can do the pool thing every day and not use so many tests. Uh, well, why aren't are they talking about doing this, Henry? Now, I mean, in fairness to them, like we didn't even know the idea existed till ten days ago, right? So they had to make their plan two months ago. So I think there's, you know, it's very new that, that this was a possibility, right? And not everybody listens like you do to this week in virology. I'm very impressed that you're <laughs> up on that, but it's possible some people missed it, you know. <laughs> and and but, they also they also lead with the with the with not the right thing, coach. Right? They lead with not science. They lead with how do we keep this money train flowing? That that is their first thought, not. How do we keep this population safe? It's no, no, no. We need all this money to come in to keep these budgets rolling. And when you lead with that, that makes you not think about <laughs> what actually you need to be doing. But P- but PR is is part of the game too, right? So if Adam Silver announced tomorrow, uh, we've consulted with doctors X, Y, and Z, and we're not going to do pool testing, which means we go from doing 1,500 tests a day to 66, 22 times three. If we, you know, if we do that kind of thing. Um, then I think that... Uh, that's, a, that's not a bad thing to have. And, and again, you're, you're, you're fighting for hearts and minds right now. It wouldn't be a bad thing to do. I just think like it's um, the way rhetoric works. You don't get big wins from doing things that lots of people don't understand. Yeah. So like if, if 100 million Americans thought pool testing was the boom dizzle, then they would have that press conference. But at this point, he'd have a press conference and everyone would be like, I don't know what that What's is. That? And it wouldn't be yeah. on the cover of the New York Times. And it'd just be like a thing Adam Silver said that sounded kind of wonky, you know, like, we're just not there yet. I, I, I'm all for it. And I think that um, we were talking about all this last night and reopening schools is a big topic at our house. But like these innovations are coming, but we are, you know, we pivot a little slower than that, right? The whole disease is only seven months old and, you know, right. and this pool testing and the paper strip tests, like we've done everything wrong, but I feel like we will get, he'll, he'll get his billion dollars, Michael Mina will, for his pool test, for his uh, paper strip <laughs> yeah. test at some point, right? Like he's not going to go through the end of the year without that. Yeah, thank you, Caleb. Hey, by the uh, way, let's not bury the lead here. Um, I didn't know oh, that yeah. Devin's tweet was featured in the on TNT last night. I didn't either. I that? saw the chat thing. Congratulations, Devin. Good job, what, what Devin. You guys, yeah. What did both of you think? I, I wrote about my general feelings um, for our article coming out today, but what was your thoughts, guys, of of just the games being back and the intensity of the games and that kind of thing? I was super excited. You know, of course, like everyone on this, I was worried about the bubble initially. I've said it a million <laughs> times. I got, like we all were. I was worried about, are we going to forget about what's going on? Like those things were all concerns. Um, 
none of none of that has happened to date, right? With the bubble, everything seems safe. The players are still very much talking about what matters. But I was happy to see basketball again, right? Like it was just awesome to hear the sneakers screeching on the front of the court and you know, guys like yelling at refs. I'm like, you know, the NBA is back when literally every single call they're arguing. I'm like, damn, we're good. We're all back now. We're yelling about stuff. It's, and it was nice to see that. <laughs> we, we learned Pat, Patrick Beverly races to complain about a call <laughs> as fast as he does on the offense or defense in transition. He flies over there. What? It's a, I love it. it. And it was great. And, you know, the basketball, I think you can tell that they're a little rusty. I know, Coach, you, you were watching them in the interviews. And you, and you can see it, right, talking about LeBron, the handle being not great. And no one you saw the ball. No you, you saw it for, but you also saw some good stuff. Like Anthony Davis looked amazing. Like you saw, you know, you saw some really good stuff in play and you saw some sloppiness, right? The only reason why the Pelicans couldn't put that game away is they turned the ball over like a billion times, right? So a little sloppy, Turnovers. but I think as we get better and we move a little forward, I think it's only going to improve and get better. And these guys clearly don't need crowds or whatever because they're, they're just competitive MFers and they just want to beat the dude across from them. So I'm excited. Henry? Maybe your story's going to come out uh, very soon after this show ends, but um, but you note in there that the turnover numbers are ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, so high. Yeah, the 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 teams. Well, we we wrote this weeks ago too. They just and we for, we learned the scrimmages were were they're, they're, the scrimmages brought value, but nobody was trying, and so all of a sudden you wanted to try out the Ferrari, but you weren't sure you put gas in it. So these guys were whoa. The defense is active. I mean, they, these games. If you blocked out the fan part, in other words, when we watch games, if the TV directors or producers, I guess, never chose to show you the fans, you would barely notice them for a lot of the game. Well, that's how it is now. And the players, the game looked the same to me, guys. I thought they competed hard. Hard. They cared. David, I've, um, I, I listened to you very carefully and learned a lot about basketball. I've noticed that you've been dropping in a little bit lately here and there. That should clear itself up in about a week. There's yeah. something about a week. Tell me about this. So, yeah, so two things. Let's talk about Zion first because it's the same thing. So I have a feeling it's just my own little civil philosophy that, that has come over the years. If you're in great shape and then you have to miss a week, it's going to take about a, a day per day to recover to get back to where you were. If you weren't in great shape to begin with, I normally double the time. So I don't know how Zion's conditioning was when he first left the bubble. How would we know that? We didn't see him play scrimmages. And so, but if you, if you guess that it wasn't great to begin with, it's going to take two weeks, which means they're done, right? We, it was minus 16 last night. He had no rebounds in the game. Uh, if you're in pretty good shape, you're going to recover faster. So now the next thing is how many games are you playing at this speed? Because those scrimmages were walkthroughs. Now we realize it. They were walkthroughs. Now you experimented with lineups, great, but there was no intensity. The Jazz, especially in two of their three games, were really lethargic. And for much of last night, they were too. <laughs> it came alive in the fourth quarter. So now, Henry, in a week, they're all going to play. These games are coming fast. Yeah. They're all playing three and four games. That is going to catch them up to speed. It's also, and I think this is the most important point, it's going to inform them of their reference points for, of their reference points for the next day of practice. Like LeBron knows, man, I had nothing for Marcus Morris. He knows he just chucked that shit up. Like, Marcus defended him perfectly. LeBron normally would show, go the other way. No. There was a transition play where LeBron, I forget who he was going up against. And it might have been Pat Bev, but he, it may have been Shannon. He quickly realized, oh, fuck. Like, he was losing <laughs> the ball just in a full-court sprint dribble. So he is, that's in his mind. I guarantee you he's watching that game. He already has. Almost for sure LeBron's already watched the game at least once. Normally they'd watch it on the flight and the way home, whatever. That didn't happen. He's sitting in his room. There's nowhere to go. Right? They're not going to a club. They're watching the games. And he's going to realize, oh, man, I got to work on this and this. And it's going to be mindful of it. And I had a player say to me the other day, this is a very smart player, but he said, I'm normally two or three steps ahead of the game. And I realize now I'm playing the game in the moment. Mm -hmm. And I said, you just got to get to game speed. Mm -hmm. Like, you just are not at game speed yet. A lot of these guys are chess players. Mm -hmm. and they're just not. Like, it almost seemed like LeBron was surprised Marcus Morris switched on him. He shouldn't have been that surprised. <laughs> he should have known. First of all, why are we even doing it? As I said to Gerard before the air, uh, Henry, you and I used to talk about how the, the Celtics acquired Marcus Morris because Second Spectrum said that he was the best defender of LeBron. So why are, you, why are you running a ball screen to get him to guard you? That made no sense. 
So the game is going to slow down for them in about a week, three or four games. And then I think we'll see the skills level back and the mental stuff too. There's that was an this, excellent um, point. Um, uh, one of the guests we had on the show wrote a book. Um, I'll tell you his name in a second. But it's about like to achieve greatness, you alternate stress and recovery. Stress and recovery, right? So like LeBron stressed himself, yeah. right? With right. this level of defense, right? He gets to, he gets to now his brain gets to while he's sleeping, his brain is quietly grinding away on like, mm, what do we do about Marcus Morris? What do we do about Landry Shamit? What do we do about this handle situation, yeah. right? And that makes him better. Yeah, I, I think that's why I think going back to Gerard's article about the G League team, that's what informs your practices. Not so I have a very right. simple philosophy. You do in a game that which you practiced. Yep. You do in practice what you hope to do in a game. And then conversely, you want as a, as a, as you face your opponent, you want to make them do stuff they haven't practiced. Yep. If you let them do what they practice all the time, you're going to get beat if their talent's any good, right? Yeah. So this is what should be informing all the stuff they're doing and it's going to make a difference. He's also brilliant players. So they're going to think fast now that they've seen it. It's been four and a half months. That's, that's a brilliant point, Coach, because and as a coach myself, and it wasn't basketball, it was an individual sport, but the mm -hmm. similar thing there, being in swimming, it's practice, right? Like my favorite time of coaching was practice, not an actual meet and race day, because on meet and race day, I already know what you're going to do. I know what your time's going to be. I know if you're going to hit it or not, because if we've done it a zillion times, well, now it's just you going out and executing it, right? Like, if all the factors are the same, your mental's in the right place, you're rested, whatever, we, we got this. Like, we're going to do it. And can you handle the stress of the moment and, and do it then, right? Same thing when you're doing basketball. When the stress comes, can you repeat that action that you've done literally a zillion times? Maybe you can, maybe you can't, right? The great ones do it all, almost always. And then, you know, we got levels from there and, 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 and they go down. But the, the practice time is where you're really able to do – do what you want. I mean, is that famous GIF or video of Patrick Ewing yelling at one of his players at Georgetown? He goes, do you take that shot in practice? Why would you ever take it in a game? Like, just yelling at him. And it's like, well. <laughs> what do you guys like a, think of the kneeling? Oh, yeah. I love bringing – can I read you this little thing about it? I was, yeah. There's a few quotes I love in here. Um, this is from Joe Varden of The Athletic. Um, uh, Michelle Roberts, executive director of the Players Union, wiped away tears when it was over. It was quite a powerful moment, she told me. What the players and coaches and the refs did, by the way, remains against the league rules. Robert said there was no negotiation with Commissioner Adam Silver on waiving the rule that players must stand for the anthem. In, a, in an email, Silver said, I respect our team's unified act of peaceful protest for social justice and, under these unique circumstances, will not enforce our long-standing rule requiring standing during the playing of our national anthem. Silver was inside HP Fieldhouse here for the anthem, and if you're wondering, he wore a light blue ball cap and a sweater inside the gym because, well, it's cold as hell in here. Anyway, Robert said, <laughs> I don't know. When asked if the kneeling would continue throughout the league's restart, it was completely a player's decision. I don't know, and I didn't ask, she said. What do you think, Gerard? You know, the, the action itself of kneeling, I, I think it's kind of played out right now. You know, like, it's been happening. I mean, Colin did it, like, years ago. Like, I think it's, it's definitely played out now. Like, I love the fact that everyone decided to do it together and show that, that strength of that That's an awesome thing. I love that Adam is like, I'm not going to punish them for this because what, for what? Like, there's, there's, there's really, because it, again, whether or not, and I, I know Adam does agree, but whether or not he does agree or not, like, he's going to look terrible if the league is, right? Like, it's not going to look good. Talk about PR. Um, what more concerns me and what I'm more interested in is, are they going to continue to talk about and bring awareness to the things that matter? And they are doing it. Like, LeBron did it in his post game, right? Um, I know that we have access to some of the Zoom post, post games, and I'm going to start, like, going to more of those and just being like, I want to know, what, what are you doing? Like, are, are we still talking about pick and roll coverages, or are we going back to Breonna Taylor and all these different names? So the actions to me, posts, are still what I'm going to be looking at. I love the show, like, the, the, what that symbolizes and what that means. And once you have actions behind the symbol, I'm good. The, in, I watched the game just real quick, Henry. I watched yeah, uh, my, my soccer team play. And this is in, in Wales and then in England proper. And there was no – to mind, uh, maybe that we had one black player, and I'm not sure the other team had any. But everyone right before the game started in Europe, in, it's in England, all 11 players take a knee from their positions – for the opening kick, whatever you call it. And you think I should know that, the kickoff, whatever. <laughs> and the referee. They all take a nail in unison. And, and so that, that's a powerful thing. I don't think they're talking about it over there. I'm sure they're not, like we are here. But it's, it's better than nothing, right? And, and I, I think Gerard's point is exactly right. 
I wanted to hear what LeBron said after the game. I thought Anthony Davis had been interviewed. He, he was the best player <laughs> on the court. He, he but was. but uh, he's LeBron. And I don't think they're going to back away from it. And my son was asking me, can they change the jersey back? And he, he, my son asked, can, will they sell jerseys with those uh, phrases on the back? Oh, if there's an opportunity for Nike to make money, I'm sure, I'm sure they will. They okay. will always sell everything, yes. I'm, I am sure they will. <laughs> and it ain't that hard to get a stitching and, and, you know, stitch up the new names on the jerseys. So, I'm sure. Which, actually, I think you had a point, Henry, but we got a great segue and transition. But to make your point. <laughs> well, I just – my one point was um, – Earlier in that interview with Times, Sean Gregory, Adam Silver defended this rule that you have to stand. And he defended the, as something the NFL doesn't even defend, which is how the NFL handled Colin Kaepernick. He had a both sides thing about that. So he set the groundwork here for being terrible. And then he took this position. I imagine he knew all along that's what he was going to do. But, you know, so to, to draw his point, like in a way, like this isn't going to change the world in and of itself. But – it struck me there's one important thing happening because of what you're saying, David. Um, and every league is basically doing this. Every sports league, everywhere there's sports, they're taking a knee, which makes an interesting opening for the NFL season, which Donald Trump has targeted as ground zero of the culture wars, right? So Adam Silver and Roger Goodell watch each other very closely, right? And so to me, like Adam Silver sent a message to Roger Goodell here, right? Like that might really matter in things like presidential elections, right? Whereas like, okay, maybe this doesn't, but if there's nowhere on planet Earth that they're forcing people to stand, like, then that matters for the NFL. They will boo uh, those fans. <laughs> some will, they some will won't. Boo. I won't be watching. It won't matter to me. Yeah. I, hope, I hope it opens up the opportunity for us to realize, like, why the hell are we playing the national anthem before games any damn way? <laughs> like, I mean, you know, like, I mean, I know why, but we don't need to. Like, there's no need for it. What about this, none. like I, I I go to some school board meetings? They literally have to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance every time. <laughs> like, it's like, what, the, like, what are you? This is so asinine. Like, weird. what are you doing? <laughs> Feels like North Korea. You don't know want me. You don't get me started on that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Gerard, let's talk about. Uh, I'm on your side. It's that way, but it makes no sense. <laughs> um, I think I know what you want to talk about, Gerard. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. So, so does Judy. <laughs> <laughs> So the ESPN, which we thought, Henry and I were talking about this, the timing was just so curious about all this, right? Like this big investigation comes out by Mark Fenerowada and Steve Fenero, these brother, the brothers that did the whole steroid cheating Balco scandal. Like these are really well uh, researched and these are excellent journalists. They know what's up. Oh my God, Henry, by the way, look at that picture in the I left know, corner of Jimmy, Jimmy Goldstein. We were talking about that yesterday. Holy crap. Creepy. And he, Anyway, <laughs> creepy, <laughs> creepy AF, um, different conversation for a different day, but the NBA has these academies in China and they li license their name out, right? Cause it's, you, you give us this amount of money. We'll let you say this is an NBA Academy. Well, it turns out there were some egregious things going on at this NBA Academy. These young athletes were not getting education as was what they were supposed to be. Um, they were being abused by coaches. Uh, one kid, uh, someone reported, got a basketball thrown in his face. Another kid got kicked in the gut by a coach. Like, oh, you know, all these like, legitimate, horrible things. China, as we know, also is a, uh, a country that is not a, a democracy, right? It is run by state government, and they control the people and everyone in and around that mainland China. And Mark Tatum, NBA's deputy commissioner, I believe is his right. title, um, He's like, well, that's going on over there. Like, we don't have direct oversight over that. And all of this, like, backpedaling and like, well, we don't know and, and dancing around the issue. And the reality is, look, man, you took the money, right? <laughs> like, you, in order to get your logo, you said it's worth X amount of hundreds of millions of dollars. You got that money. And now, in effect, you are tacitly signing off on whatever they do. So, of course... By the time it all happens, like Mark can now say, well, look, we divested. We no longer have what's going on there. Okay, but in that article, if you read it, many people have come out and complained and said notes were sent to Mark about what's going on, and it didn't seem like any action was taking place in the, in the immediacy or anyone even looking into it. It was only until it started to spread. It was like, all right, we got to do something about this. And this is, again, what happens when you mix capitalism with these kinds of things and human rights, right? Hundreds of millions of dollars is something the NBA cannot say no to. Like, they just can't as a business. It's just 
it's a non-starter. But when you are dealing with blatant human rights issues and, and violations, what 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 is your what is your calculus there? And Henry, I know we talk about this in the actual grand scheme. The NBA is the small is the small pebble, right? Like it's really about Nike and the big gigantic like mega global corporations that really dictate what goes on. And I just think that we are down a very slippery slope. The article didn't. I mean, no one's really talking about it now. The basketball's back. It's kind of over, and that's kind of a that's kind of a bummer. Um, but what I do hope is that this isn't a piece that is used by the other side to say, well, see, NBA, your, your players can't say they care about black lives if you're doing this stuff in China, right? And I think it's obviously a much more nuanced discussion like that. So, yeah, let's jump in the fray. So I feel like the NBA is, you know, will forever be in the predicament of they need to have meetings with very powerful and connected and rich people, and they need to make a deal, Right. It's true in China, it's true in the U.S., it's true all over the world. And, and, and in making those deals, it's sort of like, you know, if you're the president, you're going to have to support a Supreme Court justice, and nobody's perfect. You're going to accept some flaws from your Supreme Court justice, right? This is just how life is. Um, so that's fine. I don't mind that. But, but what are the litmus test issues? What are the things that your partner could do that would make you say, over my dead body, right? And in that, I don't, they have not given me reason to believe that they're going to just represent our values, Right. They're going to, they, they tend to get what makes them the most money and hope that they don't get busted on the things that are embarrassing, right? That's why I believe profoundly in the importance of journalism in sports, right? This idea that we just need to like make it fun and just the games and like the highlights and that's it. Like, no, 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 because then like there would be no reason not to continue uh, like supporting and having your logo on a program where kids are getting abused, right? Like, which is what was happening. So to me, you know, like I, well, what I said to you, Drive, was I, I believe profoundly in the journalistic chops of a lot of people who work at ESPN and the Fanara brothers, chief among them, right? Um, that story would have been a home run example of like my convictions here if it had come out before the NBA backed away from these academies, right? If it hadn't been like, ooh, NBA, you better close. The fact that it came out after that, Sure, it makes it better for the NBA, right? Because now the NBA can be like, who cares? We close it, all right. We're, it's already done. Um, then the, the, one, the one that uh, got my attention more than anything was uh, somebody, some source, shared an email with a line from the NBA, you know, allegedly saying, you know, don't mention that we told you not to talk about this. <laughs> Just like, I, like, if I were a betting man, I'd place a huge bet that I know who wrote that email. <laughs> All my chips in. I know that dude. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to. I want to add to this. As I texted you guys yesterday, uh, the I, I forget the title he's got, uh, executive VP or whatever. Greg Stolt. In my garage, I have a poster of the 1995-96 uh, Gator basketball team. And he was one of, uh, of some, one of the freshmen on the team, I think, that year. But two, three of the other freshmen trained with me from here. And their best player played for me four years of high school. And so I'm not friendly with Greg, although we have a million mutual friends. But Craig Brown, I am friendly with. He's a, he's a technical director in China. He played for the Gators also. He graduated before this group was done. And I, I mentored the young man. I helped him as he was in, um, I, um, accelerating his college coaching career. And then he took this great job in the NBA, and I suggested he should accept it. And I don't care if he has to go overseas. These are good people. Really, I, I, I mean, great people. So there are huge forces at work when I know in their gut they, they would not just sit by and allow – these guys were lifelong basketballers, very, very good players too, and quality men. There are major forces at work. I also have coached the best player in China to this day. He's there now. I'm the best player in their league. I've coached other pros from China. I have coaches from China that text me and email me, whatever. It's, it's, a, it's a very backward system. And the, the point about education is a big deal because it's something we deal with in Europe a lot too as someone who's involved in that soccer team. The tragedy of these players who think they can make it, so they join an academy when they're 10, 11, 12. In, in China, they don't always have the option if they're tall. You are sent there in a sense. In England, it is a choice. In Germany, you don't have to go to the academy if you don't want to. But you don't get an education the same way you would if you weren't on the track of being a pro. And then what happens when you don't make it? 
And this is not my argument, this is their argument. What do we do? Uh, and so it, I'm glad that China, in theory, asked for edu make sure their kids are getting educated. But the truth is, they're not going to educate IMG. All those guys that go to IMG to play basketball, we're not educating them at all either. They're hopefully going to make a, a pro, pro level uh, uh, business career. Or I want to make a joke here about like, Aaron Franny Simons is going to school you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. He went there. Yeah. Uh, they, they have to hope they make it. Uh, and so it's, we, we're, explo we're using sports to exploit kids all over the globe. The NBA shouldn't be in that business. Well, we I would say like, like, so in the moment that they're making the deal, so, so let's say they're decent people that you know, great people who are in the middle of the NBA organization in China who are having alarm bells go off, presumably. We don't know this, but like somebody did. There, there were people raising alarm bells. Yeah, them. clearly. They're going to their bosses, and we've probably, everybody listening to this has been in this situation at some point where you're like, oh, like, you, you go to your boss or the authority figure with like, of course we need to be decent here, right? And then some, very often there can be the conversation where the authority figure is like, oh, little person, like, yes. we have big concerns here, right? Yes. <laughs> like, what's actually happening in that moment is, A, the big concern is like, well, <laughs> Gerard's favorite band, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah right. right. Like but capitalist B, machine, baby. <laughs> but B, they're like they're kicking the can down the road. It's not that the yeah. problem isn't real; it's that they're not dealing with it today, right. which means it might fester and turn into a cancer and become like. But to me, like these are the chickens that come home to roost, right? It's like no, it's like you guys are like in a way the the bosses are naive, right? Because they're deal people and they're closing the deal, and that's I think that's all it is. But it's like no, 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 like you're gonna hear about this. Like this abuse at the academy is going to come up. Right? We're not just going to go 100 years and not hear about it again. Like, in some way, it's going to become a cancer on the organization. Right? And that's where I feel like just being decent in the moment is anti-cancer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I just, I mean, I don't know what the, how do we, I mean, the horse is well out the barn door and like literally like a billion miles away. So I don't really know how you change the system, right? It's kind of like an Ouroboros, right? All we are is a constant snake eating itself. Like, as, as we go, that's how this works. I don't, how do you stop this wheel from continuing on, right? Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> like, what is the answer? I mean, I, think I, like, I have one idea. Yeah. And, I, and I, I, it's not a great idea. I'll acknowledge that. But <laughs> we, we, Way to sell it. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying. Uh, my, my, favorite, my favorite book is a book called Word of Honor by Nelson DeMille. And it's basically the story of a, a, a guy who served in Vietnam War named Ben Tyson. I've read it in 25 years, but it's something I think about almost every day in my life. And his men, he was in charge of a group of men. I don't remember his rank. And there was a, it was based on like kind of like the Malai massacre in Vietnam, but it was a different massacre. And he, and his young 18 and 19 year old boys lost their minds and committed some terrible tragedies, right? And killed people that shouldn't have been killed. And they, he just decided we're gonna, we're all gonna take honor, honor, we're never gonna speak of this again. It was the madness of the Vietnam War by boys in a very scary situation. Well, of course, it leaked out 30 years later. He's now a powerful attorney, husband, father, whatever. And he's now being court-martialed back into the mm. army to testify against his p kids. And it's a question of what do you do? And he chooses honor. And there's lots of bad things about being honorable, like his wife is upset and whatever. And it inspired me as a 20 some year old boy, whatever I was, like, if I just always try to choose the honorable thing, I'm definitely gonna lose some battles for sure. But I, I've got my integrity intact. The NBA is on the one yard line all the time about to score a touchdown. This is a bad year with the pandemic, but they're normally a multi-billion dollar business. They are in position to always choose honor now. And if China can't meet them halfway, so be it. They can do that, they have the product. Yeah. So I don't know the answer short term. Ger Gerard's right. It does come down to money. But he, but Adam Silver can say to all the owners, if we take the honorable approach, the decent approach, the smart long term strategy, you'll all make your money in time, because we'll be avoiding so much controversy That's eventually. Um, and I, I, there's a Dalai Lama quote that um, is not this, but something like, if you're doing the wrong thing, stop. Stop. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> like. <laughs> like the first, or I think about this, like if you're, if you're lost in the woods and you're going in the wrong direction, like it, it, you'll, you don't have enough energy to find yourself. <laughs> but as soon as you're heading in the right direction, it doesn't matter how far you are. Like we can endure tremendous distances, but mm -hmm. so if you're headed in the right direction, just go that way and don't worry about it. Like just go. Like, so I right. feel like, come on, everybody, your guys, David, did you know from college, like from their college days, like 
they know how to, they know how this should have gone, right? Like just empower them a little more, listen a little more. And it actually is amazing how it heals, right? Like it is, the cancer analogy I think is actually pretty good. Like, you, you know, you can go into remission, right? Like it's doable, um, uh, but you have to be applying treatments, right? Um, right. You can't just be like, like crossing your fingers and praying, like that's not gonna do it. And it's, it's a situation where, to your guys' point, if you wanna do the right thing and follow it, like David, you're, there, there are consequences for doing the right thing, right? Like, and unfortunately, which there shouldn't be, but the consequences are possibly in a case like the NBA or whatever, you talk too loud or whistleblow too loud, you may not be gainfully employed anymore, right? Or something which then affects not just your life, my family, my kid, right? So uh, who has the, how, do you, how are you making that calculus, right? Like, how are you like literally every, okay, if I don't do this, I do this instead. I mean, yes, it, it, and I get it. If you, you, the idea should always be to do the right thing. But if you're down in that hole, man, that climb up to the top, do the right thing, woo, it's going to be rough on the way up, real rough. We're almost out of time, but um, Bilal has a great question here. Um, EPL soccer players are suing about their data being used um, to support betting companies. And he's wondering mm. uh, in the NBA who embraces, the, I'm sorry, who owns the data? Um, That's a very good question. Which, which data? Well, my, so basically like. Yeah, um, Randy, the people with the money. Correct. So, <laughs> like second spectrum type data is, would be very, very valuable. Um, to gamblers, right? And so there's been a question of like, if LeBron moves in a certain movement pattern that tells us something, does LeBron get to own that? And my understanding is that the NBA Pledge Session has not given an inch here, but in the meantime, we're in the gray area where I think they can, you know, well, they can take a risk if they want in selling it, right? Um, I don't know, Draw, do you know more about it than I do? That, that, that'll be interesting coming up in this next CBA negotiation, right? Yeah. Because it's that data and it's also, as you know, a lot of the teams with the wearables and stuff, a lot of the players don't, they don't want, they don't, they don't want to wear. I mean, Kyrie famous is like, nope, not putting any of that stuff on because if the team has access to that, up, presumably because that's how that works, that will then dictate, well, we're not giving this guy a contract. Look at those knees. He's going to be done in a year and a half or all these things. And it's like, and again, it all ties back to the cash, right? It's about the money. But what's not an option is not having the, the, the data, is that the data won't exist. Like, yes, the data is there. Yeah. They can extract it from the game broadcast. Like, there are people who could watch it in your home with a, you know, a computer could yeah. watch it and basically know similar stuff. So, like, he, the, here's an interesting side note to that, Henry. Uh, a player told me the other day that there, he's got a, one of those sleep bracelets that the NBA has given. Yeah, yeah. maybe. And he, he doesn't think he's sleeping great and he, and he, he knows, he's, he sees the results. That would be something gamblers would love to know, especially if there's a history. Certain players probably play great. Sleep, no sleep, doesn't matter. Uh, some players definitely don't, right? They're humans. We're all human, but some guys are affected more than the other. That would be, that's exactly what you're talking about. That's not cancer or whatever. It's just sleep, but it's valuable. Yeah, so, and, and we have to have good answers to that because, yeah. and, you know, and, and for the players, but also they're going to have all that on us too. Right, like you think Apple doesn't know when you go to sleep and wake up in the morning? Like, <laughs> doesn't no, no, I don't no. use Apple. Well, okay, said, <laughs> fuck the capitalistic machine. <laughs> Their profit margins are worse than freaking big oil, like by a thousand percent. <laughs> David, you still have a phone. <laughs> I, have a, I have a BlackBerry. You, oh, you think BlackBerry can track that? Are you kidding? <laughs> I think some app on your phone can. I think I think we all have. You know, yeah. I guess you. I'm kidding. They can. They, there's, they can analyze the little like. The same way the video can analyze how LeBron moves on the court, it can analyze us walking through the airport. Yeah, it's amazing. They tell things told about me our spines and hips and whatever. Well, Unbelievable. I mean, what, what you told me is amazing about that. You, you, you go back to what Amazon owns and all the different, like, equipment. I mean, Ring and all the various companies, they're all, they own it all. Like, all of it. Like, all of our data is out there. But, yeah. Henry, to that, the Whoop point, who owns the Whoop data? When, like, a team contracts Whoop to do what? Who, who has that? I, I don't know. And, and even trickier, um, <laughs> because I'm such a dork, I went for a run during the Sloan Conference this year with um, a University of Oregon professor guy who knows a lot about this stuff. But he, um, and I'm like, right then, I was like, whoop, knows where the pandemic is. Because they know every time anybody gets a little temperature, their heart rate up, or all these signs. So I'm like, they have a database of where COVID is yeah. spreading without having to take a single test. Like, so part of me is like, hey, that's private. But B, I'm like, how can you not use that? Yeah, like, yeah. 
every Apple watch, every whatever, like, like those, these tech companies know well in advance of anybody waiting in line for a COVID test. How are we not using that? It seems crazy. Like I, I'm so one of the, you know, we're disappointed in a lot of things of the federal response. One of them is like, how are we not using Silicon Valley to, to define the spread, right? Because it, they're all about doing, doing good so they can do well, Henry. It's, like, <laughs> it's not about money in Silicon Valley. That's not what they care about. They, 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 want to, they want to do well so they can do good for the earth and for everybody else. Don't you know that? <laughs> Lion MFers. <laughs> so, Gerard has ire for a few different groups, but when it's Silicon Valley ire, it especially pleases me. He does it like in a, with a particular flair. <laughs> yeah. It's because personal what, Silicon Valley. Yeah, well, because I, I worked out there and they yeah, give me all yeah. this bullshit about, oh, it's so, I'm like, y'all are capitalists like everybody else. Just yeah. admit it. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Just say what you are. If you, if you listen to old Rich, well, obviously he's passed away, R listen to Richard Pryor tapes and, and hear his police person's voice, I think of Gerard. It's not quite the same pitch, but it's fantastic beyond Andy Murphy too. Yeah. But Richard Pryor has this incredible police person's voice. Okay. Um, Monday, uh, mm. Black Trey, Trevon Edwards. Oh, Trey. Let's go. Love that guy. Um, so we should go. It's time. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you, David. Thank you, Judy. Be safe, everyone.